Um, thanks, everyone, for coming out. My name is Kent Bai. I do the Voices of VR podcast. And today, I'm going to be talking about the ultimate potential of VR, which I've asked over 2,000 people over the last eight plus years. And I'll be covering both the promises and perils of VR. Oh, I need this clicker. OK, here we go. Sorry. <laughs> Um, so yeah, I've been doing the Voices of VR podcast and kind of doing an oral history of VR. And uh, just I've been really fascinated with how VR has been emerging within the industry. And I just wanted to be on the front lines talking to the makers and the creators. And as I've been doing that, I've always been asking them, what is the ultimate potential of VR? And then also just the ethical dilemmas and moral dilemmas of VR have naturally kind of emerged out of this process of this being in conversation. So I'm going to be going through the first two sections are kind of more primer introductory stuff, and then we'll be uh, diving into the landscape of the VR potentials and perils. So I wanted to go into first the four evolutionary phases of tech, and then we'll give a primer of uh, presence and embodiment, and then the landscape. So Simon Wardley has this model of technology evolution where he has these uh, four distinct phases where there's initially the genesis of the, duct the sort of prototype of this academic idea that was possible, and there's the custom-built enterprise applications that are being made, and then finally gets launched into a consumer product, and then maybe potentially at some point it gets into a ub ubiquitous commodity. So there's kind of like this uh, phase of technology evolution that happens, and so we can look at this in VR to kind of elaborate. So back in 1968, we have Ivan Sutherland with the Sword of Damocles of just this idea of fusing all this technology together for the very first time. And then in the mid, late, late 80s, early 90s, you have VPL, Jan Lanier, starting to do these uh, virtual reality uh, headsets for the enterprise. The, the machines were around a million dollars each, and so it was not necessarily accessible for most consumers or any consumers really, until we have the consumer revolution of VR that's been happening from 2013 to the present, where we've had kind of a confluence of all the display technologies, IMUs, and everything was basically cheap enough to be able to have this revolution of uh, consumer virtual reality. And then eventually, at some point, will we have the ubiquitous nature of AR and VR? It's a bit of an open question as to like when that might be happening. I have a sense that it's inevitable, but it's probably more of a matter of when. We may enter some winters. It's like. Uh, kind of decide uh, you know, the Heisenberg uncertainty where you know the either the position or the velocity, but you can't know both. I feel like that with VR, where I feel like it's going to happen at some point. I just don't know when. So I'm kind of taking that approach of you know, people are like, oh, is VR dead? But I feel like there's enough of the ethical and moral dilemmas and the other insights about the lessons that I've learned from VR that as we look at VR, we can understand the potentials of the human experience. And as long as we know the bounds of the human experience, we can look at how technology is influencing that, whether that's VR, whether it's AR, whether it's AI, or any technology. So that's kind of the approach that I'm trying to take in this talk here. So again, we have these different phases of the prototype and genesis. We have the custom-built uh, enterprise, and then the consumer product, and then it becomes commodity. And a lot of what I try to do is focus on, OK, what's happening in these enterprise spaces? What's happening in the B2B, in these other areas of VR that people may not be aware of, to see how that might be influencing the future of um, consumer tech. So, Another just example, we can go back to the like early 60s. Actually, it was like the first motion capture systems were like 1962 with the Harrison's Animac. Just imagine like at the very brink of computer technologies, they're already doing like motion capture. Um, then you move into like the, um, the late 80s and up until 2009, you have performance capture. So being able to track different aspects of your face and to translate that into uh, CGI characters. And then at uh, 2015, I was actually at GDC and had a chance to check out the face shift technology, which eventually was bought by Apple and kind of is in a lot of phones right now. But you have these kind of depth sensor capture that has like the emotional expressivity. And that's something that has continued to be in tech. But that came into the Vive facial tracker in 2021, which was in a peripheral that you can add onto the VR headset to be able to capture your face. And then now with the MetaQuest Pro, you have it built into the headset. So it's already kind of like you can see the evolution through these different phases to see how the technology kind of evolves and diffuses out into the culture. So I'm going to do a little bit of a primer of presence and embodiment, because like when you think about VR, what makes it so special, it is this aspect of both presence and embodiment. So I just want to give a little bit more context before I dive into these other uh, potentials. So when I went to the Oculus Connect 1 back in 2014, I have Brendan Airbay, the CEO of Oculus at the time, who's basically on stage saying that like one of the most important things is presence. And I'm very familiar with like presence from like more of like esoteric, you know, mindfulness and meditation. But these ideas of presence have been a long part of virtual reality and a key um, aspect of what makes VR so different than other technologies. So 
Nell Slater has defined two aspects of presence as in terms of the place illusion and the plausibility illusion. The place illusion is essentially that you believe that you're in a place, even though that you're not. The plausibility illusion is that you think that everything is happening is real and plausible, even though you know it's kind of a virtual simulation. So, but at the same time, you kind of have this suspension of disbelief that you're kind of immersed into these worlds. Oh, and by the way, um, on my Twitter, I have like a link to these slides if you want to check them out later and dig into them, because I know it's, we'll be going through a lot of stuff here. So the way that I look at these aspects of presence are uh, dimensions of active presence, mental and social presence, emotional presence, and embodied and environmental presence. And I think a good way to look at this is to see that the existing communication media sort of have a, a center of gravity. So you can look at the uh, video game technologies that are all about expressing your agency and will and interacting into uh, the sort of dynamic unfolding process of a video game. Then you have the um, mental and social presence, which is a lot of communication technologies and social media and the written language and uh, narration and literature, but also the internet and human computer interaction. So there's all this other dimension of the ways that we communicate with each other. And then we have the emotional presence, which film is all about like building, releasing uh, tension and modulating your emotions through both the music and the mood and lighting and the vibes, but also through the process of editing and storytelling. And then we get into the embodied and environmental presence, which is really what is unique about virtual reality, is that you have this sense of both architecture and theater, of a sense of place, but also your, your direct uh, sensory um, experiences for your, all your, your sight, touch, smelling, and haptics, and everything is basically fused into this new medium of virtual reality. So kind of thinking about it simply, it's taking action, making choices, emotional immersion, and sensory experience. And all of these are all happening at the same time. Um, and virtual reality is kind of blending them all together. Now, we can also look at the evolution of different communication media, where you have like from oral storytelling to theater to books, film, radio, TV, video games, internet, mobile phone. And you know, as, each, as you have each of these uh, subsequent uh, technologies, you have kind of a, um, a nested aspect of all the subsequent media is encompassing all the other aspects of the previous media. So you have this point where VR and AR is kind of encompassing all the previous media, and each of those media have like a center of gravity, like video games is all about agency, and film is about emotional presence, and books are all about like the mental aspects of your imagination and language. And so uh, as we move on and think about this uh, concept of embodied cognition, the, you know, when we think about cognition, we, we tend to think about, okay, all that's what's happening in the brain, but it's also what's happening out through our entire body, our sensory experience, and embodied cognition is this the fact that the, the thinking doesn't just happen in the brain, it actually happens distributed throughout our entire body. We have our motor cortex, it's all about moving. We are kind of like moving, and as we move, we're, uh, that is impacting how we think, and so we're, uh, so moving is thinking, but it's also embedded within the context of the world, so there's this um, aspect in which that there's this relational context of which what, we're, what the world that we're situating in will impact how we think, as well as um, all the aspects of our body. So when you have immersive technologies that are impacting the way that we move, you're now going to change the way that we are thinking um, and the way that we communicate and understand the world. So if you look at some of the different embodied technologies, we can go back to 2015, which is the GDC with the uh, HTC Vive having like hand track controllers that were super accurate to sub millimeter accuracy. And then we go into like uh, following that, I went to the Sundance of 2016 where it was like my first experience of having like full body tracked um, experiences where it was like feeling like I was fully immersed into the sense of embodiment. They've been having like these motion tracked experiences for many, many years, but in terms of like Sundance being a nexus for some of these kind of diffusing out into the culture. Um, and then in like January 4th of 2017 at CES, the HTC announced these trackers to be able to uh, hook into the, uh, the Vive trackers. And so then you have like communities like VR chat where people are putting these body trackers all over their body starting like August of 2017. And that's cultivated this entire like underground movement of like dance scenes and rave culture within VR chat because people are being fully embodied within these avatars. You have this kind of virtual body ownership illusion. So we're moving into a world where we're going to have like um, pose estimation from artificial intelligence, either embedded within the context of the headset, or there, we may have to have like an external system that's sort of really getting a high quality aspect of how we're moving our body. But I, I feel like full embodiment within VR, whether it's indigenous to like the, the headset or external, is like an inevitable evolution for where technology is going. And the next frontier is things like non-invasive neural interfaces, which are these watches that are going to be from like Control Labs, which is acquired by Meta, which has uh, an ability to track what's happening in what they call electromyography or EMG. 
So it's able to detect the firing of an individual motor neuron through artificial intelligence, which means you can just think about moving, and that thought of moving will allow you to move a virtual avatar. So it's basically this interface that's kind of getting into this whole other aspect of the intention of movement for us to do different types of human-computer interaction. It's the future of HCI when it comes to certainly augmented reality, but also potentially in VR to be able to have all sorts of exotic embodiments. So that's kind of like an overview of both the presence and the future of where, right, where we're at right now, and it's going to only get even more high fidelity. All right, let me take a quick sip. All right, so we're going to get into the landscape of VR potentials and perils. And now, um, I went to the Laval Virtual in 2017 and or 2019, and we were did a whole brainstorm of different ethical and moral dilemmas, and we started to kind of map it out into a, a different cartography. And then later in 2019, I did a whole XR ethics manifesto. And in that talk, I basically tried to be like, after all these different interviews, what are the full landscape of all the ethical and moral dilemmas of VR? And uh, that's this is a whole like one hour talk or half hour talk that I did. And I've done many different work with the IEEE Global Initiative of the Ethics of uh, Extended Reality. We took this mapping and basically created eight different white papers and I have a whole 14 hour series diving into all these things. So we're not gonna dive into every single dimension here, but suffice to say that I'm kind of using this as a way to enter into both the potentials and the perils. And this is kind of like a, an overview of, of some of those different aspects. Okay, so uh, I'm gonna start with entertainment and gaming because I feel like that's where the consumer VR is starting. Uh, we've had a long history of other contexts, but for anybody that is uh, understanding and seeing what's happening with consumer VR, it's been driving through gaming. Things like Beat Saber, getting into these deep flow states. Your body is now a controller, so you're using your body to engage with these different puzzles as stuff is coming at you. And um, yeah, it's, it feels like it's, um, you know, entertainment is the thing that has been driving the resurgence of VR. Uh, the early adopters are the gamers. Exercise in VR has actually been a bit of surprising for some folks, but you end up having this ability to actually get like real exercise. And exercise is really boring. Not people, people don't like to do it. So things like Supernatural give you like a coach and uh, an excuse to go into these immersive experiences and actually enjoy your exercise. And so that's been a, a huge driver as well uh, for early adopters of people doing fitness in VR. Yeah, Half-Life Alex has been one of the most amazing sort of exploratory adventures. You have this kind of going into another fantasy world and this ex exquisite amount of world building and this interactive experiences. I feel like that's kind of like a pinnacle of the types of gaming experiences that I've had from Valve expanding out the Half-Life series. Just an amazing story and experience um, that they have. But um, the other aspects that I've been covering a lot within the context of my work is I've been going to things like Sundance and South by Southwest and Tribeca and the Venice Film Festival and if a doc lab since 2015, and I um, like to go to these different experiences and see all the different stories and talk to all the different storytellers and makers and just get a sense of where things are going. And I feel like storytelling is actually gonna be a huge driver as we move forward into the future of spatial computing. And this is a, a slide from Alien Rescue, which I feel like is one of the most immersive stories that I've been because you, I was a character and I was like live action role playing with other actors and we got to go on this whole adventure and, and there's different choices I had to make and so it was, it's like we're moving from the storytelling to the story living where I'm becoming a part of the process of an unfolding dynamic experience that is being cultivated and created by other people and it's my participation is actually changing and shifting the overall experience. So immersive storytelling is a huge thing that I've been focusing on, and I feel like it's going to be a big part of what is, drives adoption of VR in the future, even if uh, Meta is super obsessed with games and has been kind of like not giving storytelling its full due, in my opinion. Even though there's a lot of great stuff, it's sort of it's second tier to uh, there's a lot of Ready Player One visions for what's driving the metaverse for for uh, Meta, and they've yeah, anyway. I'll move on. <laughs> um, the holodeck is just this idea that you could speak out and say, give me this experience. I mean, we're actually so close to this already happening. I mean, well, I expect to see this. I mean, it's already happening. People say, I want this. Uh, give me experience. The thing is, it doesn't understand story, so it's just like images without much arc. But we're, the holodeck is generative AI plus VR. We're like on the cusp of that, of the next like two to five years, 10 years, where it's going to be is going to be like mind blowing. Um, Artists that are blazing new neural pathways, um, Pete Moss told me this very early, like look to the artists, what the artists are doing, because artists 
they are taking what's possible and they're pushing the limits of what's possible. So you go into an experience and you experience something that you literally couldn't experience in physical reality. And so that is blazing new neural pathways. And so when you come out of VR, it's actually changing the way that you look at reality. And that's what Jaron Lanier says, is that the VR experience happens once you take the VR headset off. Uh, creation tools is something that, you know, things like Tiltbrush has now been open source into OpenBrush and uh, different Gravity Sketch and all sorts of tools that you can be in VR and basically be in this dreamlike environment and sort of capture different aspects of your imagination and create things. With generative AI, that, that boundary between your imagination and how you're ac actually able to experience it is only going to get smaller and smaller. It's going to get easier and easier. But I think this has been a blocker for what's holding VR back is that it is very difficult to be able to create these types of immersive 3D experiences. But with the 3D creation tools on top of a generative AI, it's going to sort of open up this new vista of possibilities. So some of the perils, obviously, everybody who thinks about VR is like, well, it's all about escapism and addiction. And I feel like that's true, and most people like sort of go that to the default. I think there's actually a lot of dimensions of like people connecting more to other people within these virtual environments, but it is actually a problem or an issue. Uh, I remember Carl Krantz told me that he was in VR and he spent 12 hours in VR and he didn't. He only thought he was in there for two hours. So imagine going into VR experience and coming out and you've been in there for 12 hours, and you've sort of like have this issue of what if these technology companies are kind of like hacking our brains to the point where they're just getting us to stay in there for their own surveillance capitalism needs? That's an issue if we don't have a larger ethical direction for how this technology develops and we can have like Handy Crush in VR, but like way worse. Um, so adult content is something that is a part of VR and there's a, I think a misperception that people are like, oh, porn is gonna drive all of VR. And gaming has actually been the, the core driver of VR, but there is like 360 videos, there is like, you know, um, you know different uh, 18 plus content within VR chat and teledildonics and haptic innovations that are happening in the realm of adult content. And I guess the ethical issue is there's actually no age verification anywhere on VR to actually know what the age of some of these people are. And some of these experiences within VR chat especially are 18 plus. And so you have situations where you might have children grooming or just inappropriate uh, situations for minors. So that's something that has to be sorted out as we move forward. All right, so moving on to medical health. So medical health is actually one of the issues that's actually been have like 35 years of research that there's been so many different innovations for what's happening. The thing that blew my mind was at the Silicon Valley Virtual Reality Conference in 2014 when James Baja had created this experience at the time that's called Diplopia, now called Vision, Vivid Vision, where he's able to essentially cure his lazy eye with VR. He's like. The, his eye needed to be trained like a muscle, and he was using VR to train that muscle, and he, he, couldn't, uh, he wasn't able to see in 3D before using this, and then afterwards he was able to see in 3D. So because of that, you have this idea of neuroplasticity where you can literally rewire your brain. Um, so that's been a, a huge aspect. There's so many different aspects of medical applications when it comes to VR. Um, there was actually, just recently, um, Walter Greenleaf gave a talk where he said that there's now more than 300 emerging VR and AR companies. You don't see a lot of that from like the mainstream VR press because it is so focused on gaming, but he's sort of mapping out all these different applications of medical applications of VR. And for me, this is like the thing that is the most exciting. However, Meta has kind of like ignored enterprise and actually been very antagonistic because they kind of want to skip that enterprise phase and they want to skip straight to the consumer market. So they create privacy policies that are antithetical to HIPAA and everything else. So, there's a lot of ways in which Meta has been actually like holding back VR because of their obsession of trying to push it and rush it uh, and not have it organically grow through the enterprise phase first. The end result is that there's a lot of stuff that's happening in the in, uh, medical field and none of the people in medical AR can even really use the Meta projects. They have to go to like Pico and other, other like HUC. Anyway, um, Walter um, is sort of elaborating the different use cases and at the high level there's like training, assessments, interventions, adherence, care delivery, and prevention and wellness are kind of like the different types of applications that we're seeing in medical XR. This is a, an experience that I did at SVVR, it's by BioFlight VR. One of the most intense experiences I had, I'm in an emergency room, there's a baby that's turning purple and dying and the mother is there screaming for her child to be saved and you have to like figure out what to do and you have no idea what to do because you're not a doctor and you like have to save this baby's life. And it's like I'm thrown into this experience and it was like so intense but the idea of creating the different contextual dimensions for you to make the right choices, that, what's makes, uh, that, that is what makes VR so powerful is that you are embedded into that context and you have to make the actual embodied movements to, to do this. And so these different types of training scenarios have been really amazing. And uh, Skip Rosa has been doing a lot of stuff with like PTSD uh, um, exposure therapy. 
and the idea here is that you're able to give people a little bit of experience and help um, heal them through the exposure therapy. The other side is that if, if VR can heal people from trauma, it can also induce trauma. So what are the ways that we can uh, think about what are these trauma triggers for people and creating situations that are going to be you know, per perpetuating or amplifying either existing trauma or creating new trauma? All right, so I'm going to do a quick uh, bit into resources, money, and values. So there's a lot of hype about the metaverse, and I'm really skeptical about most of it because the term's really been hijacked, I think, by other people that are just kind of whopping onto it. But I look to the Cronus Group and the interoperability standards of things like OpenXR, things like the metaverse standards form, where you have different industry folks that are trying to put down the underlying baseline of what those open standards are going to be to actually drive the future of the metaverse. And ironically, it's going to be companies like IKEA that are trying to create these open standards with GLTF to be able to put like furniture on the web and, and not necessarily always the gaming part. So I feel like the, the future of the metaverse uh, is going to be like look to OpenXR, the Kronos Group, and the Metaverse Standards Forum to see what kind of like open standards are created out of that. I think access to XR technology is a huge like uh, aspect of like all dimensions of technology. But when we think about where this technology is going, how who has ac access to the technology and what's blocking access to other people having access to this technology? There's already a digital divide. VR, if anything, is accelerating that digital divide without any sort of way of thinking about that as a holistic level. This is more at the platform level and economics, but it's important to point out. We have virtual gift economies, which uh, AnyLand VR and also a large part of like VR chat, because it doesn't have an embedded economy, there's a lot of people like sharing a lot of really culture and art and exchanging different aspects of for like the, the whole um, you know, communities within VR chat that are um, you know, the uh, prefabs community is creating all these different stuff, and it's really like a, a gift economy of, that's being developed that's really driving so much innovation, and things like uh, NELand was doing this, but also VRChat. And VRChat has like an, uh, like an optional subscription model to be able to fund them, so you can pay or not, you can still have access to it, but it's like, hey, maybe we're going to move into this type of model where you get a little extra things when you have a subscription, but we're not going to rely on other uh, models. We have virtual skins and avatars, which something like Fortnite or Roblox or even like Rec Room has a lot of this, like your virtual appearance is a big part of what's driving the economy. So that's an option, um, but VRChat doesn't do that. It's also that the platform level where you have both Meta and Apple and Google are taking the 30% cut and there's been a lot of like antitrust debate, uh, like lawsuits and there may be stuff that is coming forth from the EU that's trying to address this, but there's like a failed a lawsuit from Tim Sweeney to try to address this. But at the end of the day, do we want to have the future of the next paradigm of computing, have everybody, like the, like the three major companies, take a 30% cut of everything you do? We wouldn't have a lot of those companies without them being developed on the open platform like the PC. So it seems like if we're going to move into this world, it's going to create these disparities at an economic level that we have to kind of figure out. Then we have the dimension of surveillance capitalism, which is driving like the business models of companies like Meta and Google. And there's. Um, actually a lot of open gaps for as we move into the future of virtual reality te technologies, it's going to get even even worse. I uh, just did an interview with Nita Farahani, who has a book that just is coming out on Tuesday called The Battle for Your Brain, which is talking about all these different dimensions of neurotechnologies, which includes uh, aspects of virtual and augmented reality, but also other things like brain-computer interfaces. And we're kind of headed, we're kind of sleepwalking into dystopia of what's happening with the future of these technologies. So that's important to set up into now that we get into like the self biometric data and identity. Because uh, we're moving into a realm where we're combining different aspects of neurotechnologies. This is a headset that was made by OpenBCI, and they're um, adding different things like EOG, EEG, EMG, EDA. These are all like biometric signals that are coming in that are eventually, as things are integrated, they're going to be kind of feeding into our experiences. And that on the one hand, they're going to be able to be great for like mental health and wellness and focus experiences for you to like really dial in your attention and your productivity. But on the other hand, um, and, and also do like feedback loops for you know, immersive stories and games, and it's going to be really cool. But on the other hand, that data in the hands of the wrong person is also going to be revealing all of this really intimate information. So VR has like this existential threat to privacy. And right now, the way that privacy laws are made, they're not really addressing the biggest threats from VR. 
So there's things like psychographic inferences from eye gaze data. So you have things like this research that you can just look at the eye and determine different things like gender, age, biometric identity, your cultural background, mental health, personality traits. And so essentially, this is what uh, Britton Heller calls biometric psychography. So there's all these psychographic aspects of these company as they have access to this type of data, they're able to make even more detailed inferences about us. And that type of biometrically inferred data that's whether it's about our likes, our dislikes, our preferences, none of this is covered by any privacy law at all. It's a huge gap and it needs to be covered in some degree. Um, so as we move forward, you can look at things like this is like taking my presence framework, you have everything from behaviors, intentions, actions, movements, mental thoughts, cognitive processes, cognitive loads, social presence, your effective state, your emotional sentiment, your facial expressions, micro expressions, your stress, arousal, physiological reactions, eye gaze, attention, body language, muscle fatigue, and not only for each of these, they're all going to be fused together. You can do just looking at your hand pose and head pose and extrapolate your eye gaze data from research. And so as these all things get fused together, it's essentially going to be able to map out so much of the intimate aspects of ourselves. And Nita Farahani sort of summarizes these in terms of like self-determination, freedom of thought, mental privacy, which for her includes both the physiological reactions and the effective, reaction, effective reactions. But this book, um, it's actually in the bookstore. You can buy it before it comes out. Uh, it's called Battle for Your Brain, Defending the Right to Think Freely in the Age of Neurotechnology. This is the podcast that's published for me now. I just did a really in-depth interview. Uh, for her, she's trying to define this new human right what, that she calls cognitive liberty. And for cognitive liberty, it's an umbrella term that includes both self-determination, freedom of thought, and mental privacy. And that you need to define these human rights um, in order to have them kind of diffuse out through uh, international law. And another approach is the uh, Raphael Yusto neuro rights, which is trying to identify things like the right to mental privacy, the right to identity, the right to agency, the right to fair access to mental augmentation, and the right to be protected from algorithmic bias. So if you break this down, if you are able to violate someone's mental privacy and then map out their identity, then you can start to nudge them in ways that is undermining their right to agency because there's an asymmetry of power if you have all this data and you're able to maybe understand people better than they understand themselves. You can start to kind of hack into their fixed action patterns and start to control and manipulate them in a way that is kind of undermining their, their sense of cognitive liberty. So <clears throat> Nita Farahani is saying that we need to basically establish a new human right of cognitive liberty. And from there, that needs to diffuse out into like EU. And then from there, all these other things. And eventually, you know, five, 10, 30 years later in the US, we'll get like a US federal privacy law. The EU is basically like decades ahead of where we're at here. And so I don't put a, like we need a federal uh, privacy law here in the United States, but they're like, they're not, none of this stuff is in the discussion at all. So back to identity, you have a stylized expression of identity. So being able to choose your different avatar representation and VR chat is probably the most expansive in terms of the different types of identity. I mean, have people, avatars made out of like seven or nine different cats and just, there's a lot of really wild stuff that like has blown my mind just like seeing what's happening in the context of both like, you know, Neos VR or VR chat, you know, both of these are two places where you see a lot of innovation with avatar representation. But if you're not giving people a, cho a choice to upload their own avatar, then you need to ensure that you have a diverse selection of avatars because the last thing you want is to force people to be in a virtual experience where they don't feel like they have any identity that's representing how they identify themselves. So having that diversity selection of avatars is a key ethical component. Now, Meta is really hot on creating these kind of really creepy photorealistic codec avatars that are basically like, these, that's, that, what you're seeing is not a picture, it's a recreation of someone's like face. And like when you see it animated, it's even more creepy. You can kind of see the thing down in the lower right. But they, they have a lot of effort of creating these photorealistic avatars. My sense is that most people want like these stylized, weird like VR chat avatar representations and not the photorealistic. But if we do go down that route, then um, what happens when it comes to like deep fakes and AI voices to be able to speak uh, people's identity? So you know, these are some of the different um, you know, Mark Zuckerberg avatars. But you can just imagine if you have these, these photorealistic avatars, then how do you ensure that you are you in these different platforms and how do you kind of have that when we have this generative AI that's able to spoof people's like their voice and maybe even their mannerisms, how they move, and that's gonna be an issue even more when we get into these virtual spaces. There's also this phenomenon of Snapchat dysphoria as people use these facial filters, then they actually like more identify with these facial filters and they want to like, they feel like this fundamental uncomfortableness with their body that leads them to wanna to get like uh, plastic surgery. So we have this effect of as people are modulating their identity, then what are the impacts for things like Snapchat dysphoria? 
And then consciousness hacking is something that's a little bit more of the exalted potential, where if you have access to all this, you have the ability to be able to expand your mind, track your mind, do uh, the quantified self, and be able to you know, uh, push the limits of what you're able to do as a, as a person. And then, hold on a second. So then you have things like um, David Eagleman and U.S. Sensory Vest, where this is a haptic vest that is able to do sensory substitution. So you're able to turn your torso into an ear. So basically, if you're deaf, you could like take the haptic input and you get the data into your brain. And you're able to you know kind of somehow translate that into hearing. And so what are ways you're able to substitute existing senses or uh, add new senses? So this is North Paul, where you put this device on your foot and you're able to know where, like where True North is, and you kind of develop the sixth sense ability to know where the True North is after you have this kind of on your body enough. So What's the ability to kind of expand your, your senses as you go out? And you know, as we go forward in the transhumanism, it's going to get really weird. Um, so early education, communication, we have telepresence. So telepresence is just like when you're communicating with other people, you're in a shared space, and you get to hear like a dynamic of like a spatialization of sound. Like there's a reason why you know, coming to South by Southwest is different than actually you know, having Zoom meetings. You, there's something about the spatialized presence of, of people together that is qualitatively different, but there's something the way that our memory works in terms of the way that we understand space and spatial context and where people are positioned in space. And if you like want to turn to somebody and make a little snide comic, but only that you two can hear. Uh, so telepresence in VR is going to be continued to be a huge part, uh, both of just hanging about across many different contexts. Also data visualization, as you have this visualization of different data, it creates this spatial architecture that allows you to be embedded into the experience in a way that allows you to elucidate the different relational dynamics of information and data visualization. Early education and virtual field trips, uh, KaiXR has been doing a lot of really amazing like uh, virtual tours and giving them to kids to be able to take them to different museums. But you know, the sad thing is, is that education is actually probably the biggest potential, but it's also like the most underfunded and most underappreciated because there's not like a clear economic business model for it. So you read something like Ready Player One and you see like the Oasis and this like sci-fi vision about what education could be, but like there's only a handful of people that are really actually building it. Engage is doing a lot of amazing stuff. Um, and there's been some communities in alt space and, you know, but and KaiXR is doing great work, but again, it's like completely under, uh, underfunded, underappreciated, but probably one of the biggest potentials. Also, like if you think about the minimum age for VR, right now it's 13 for a number of reasons. Um, one of the reasons is that you know as eyes are still developing and you have like virgins accommodation conflicts, then you don't want to put kids into VR because it may actually like mess up how their eyesight is developing over time. And so as they're thinking about VR, and, and a lot of this is sort of like not fully like have clear boundaries as for how that process works. A big reason why the minimum age is 13 is actually more due to privacy because of COPA compliance, because with these companies that want to do a lot of surveillance capitalism, they want to gather all this data. So they like, we don't want to have to deal with, you know, doing these, having uh, people less than 13. Rec room is actually probably one of the areas that has been doing a lot of stuff younger, younger 13, but Meta kind of kicked off all the younger than 13 off of the VR platform. But it's an issue of people that are less than 13 and they're in all these different spaces, then how do you sort of account for people that are not necessarily following what they should be following? So home, uh, family, private property. So we look at different aspects of volumetric memories. I think this is actually going to be something that as time goes on, we're going to have more of these volumetric ways of capturing different scenes. And then photos are funny because you take a photo, and the photo actually doesn't mean much or means more to you the more time goes on, if that makes sense. Like you look at something, you're, able, you're glad you have that photo from 10 years ago. So we're going to have a lot of like volumetric like moments from like from 2013 on, where people are going back into these moments in time. Uh, but if you think about like capturing memories and going back and capturing different aspects with your family, um, different spatial contexts. I mean, the Google Earth VR for me has been one of the really amazing experiences because I was like, I'm going to go to all the places I lived, and I'm going to like tell the story of my life based upon these geographic locations, and I like could virtually go to all those places in the course of like an hour. And just all these memories come up. And you know, the ethical aspect is like, what does it mean to overwrite your memories based upon these virtual kind of corrupted versions of the your memories? And you know, but the, the ability to go and have those memories connect to the earth and to kind of do this virtual travel is another aspect um, is a huge part. And ideally, you come out and you actually want to be connected to the earth and not just be like, oh, Google Earth is totally fine. I don't need to go anywhere. Because there is an element of travel, but there's also like, you know, climate change and all the limits of that. 
Uh, volumetric privacy is a huge thing because there's actually like a Fourth Amendment protection of your home and unreasonable search and seizures. But there's also interpretation of that, which means that when you give data to a third party, there's no reasonable expectation for that data to be private. So it's basically eliminating the Fourth Amendment, uh, all those protection privacies. And so what's that mean when you think about the volumetric privacy of your home and what happens to the data of these different scans of your places that are now going to potentially get in the hands of government officials that they shouldn't actually have access without you know, due process or a warrant. Meta is actually working towards a lot of really creepy things, like what they call contextually aware AI. So if you just look at this for a moment, imagine you're cooking with AR, and the AR is telling you you've already added enough salt. Like, there's a certain element of cooking where you're actually like tasting things, and maybe the AI is not going to be able to do that. But the idea that they have this other thing called like episodic memory AI, which is like, where did I put grandma's watch? So imagine what you would need for that. You would need to have this AI that's basically a big brother watching all your movements, and like they'd be, I don't want AI to be able to answer that question. That's like super creepy and a transgression of what I think is reasonable for what I want. Um, so the problem is, is that you have AI, like companies like Meta saying, well, we want to do contextually airway AI. And you can look at things like Ego 4D, which is their challenges. So which is literally, this is what they want to do. They want to be able to say episodic memory, what happened when, forecasting, what will I do next, hand object interactions, what am I doing now, and, and how. AR, AV, diarization, who said what and when, and social, how are we interacting? This is like the roadmap of where we're going for augmented reality, and I just hope that I am able to communicate the urgency of how ridiculous this is. Um, contextually aware AI is a really bad idea, and we need to do something to stop it. Um, other partnerships, so um, Joe Hunting did a really amazing documentary, it's on HBO Max, it's called uh, We Met in Virtual Reality. It sort of shows the cultivation of these different romantic relationships of people going on dates and really, really connecting at this romantic level. It's a really amazing film, I highly recommend checking out. But this idea of virtual dates is already happening as we move forward. Um, you know, we have this famous TED talk that Chris Milk gave, VR is an empathy machine. I feel like there's a bit of a bifurcation of people who are like, all on board of VR and empathy machine, and other people are like, there's a lot of limits to empathy, Paul Bloom against empathy, you know, a lot of sort of problematic aspects of the colonial nature of going into places and seizing stories without the people that you're covering having full authorship of how that story is being told. On top of that, how much can you actually be in someone's shoes and see a video of what's happening in Syria and know what it means to be a Syrian refugee? So I feel like this is a big debate where there are a lot of potentials, but there's a lot of like sort of like, um, I don't know, a lot of problems with this idea as well. Virtual harassment and bullying is something that, um, obviously, there's been a lot of dimensions of once you get into these virtual spaces and have people that are um, able, like we're moving from a place of content moderation into conduct moderation. And so how are we behaving and how we modulate that? And it's going to be some AI overlords that are trying to determine this because this is essentially not a problem that humans can solve, or there's going to be sort of more of a self-moderated aspect that we have to kind of figure out how do you sort of enforce these codes of conduct that these companies have. Because it is these uh, populations, marginalized populations of you know, this inter intersectional access of privilege, domination, oppression, you can look at the bottom side of all the different folks of like women, gender deviant, people of color, uh, Aboriginal folks, uh, lesbian, gay, uh, bisexual, you know, all these different dimensions of oppression that we have embedded into our culture. This is just amplified in these virtual technologies, and there's not anything that's actually like, you know, by default going to be a part of the technological architecture that's going to, to like change this dynamic. And so there's going to be a lot of dimensions for how do we actually create these spaces that are safe for people to be in, how do you moderate the conduct, and how do you enforce these codes of conduct. Death, collective resources, um, there is a grief rituals, like this uh, experience by um, Paisley Smith called Homestay, where um, she's talking about a friend who died by suicide, and it's a whole ritual to honor his life. And so a really quite moving experience to find new ways that we can sort of come together. And just this past week, there was a number of different uh, funerals. I know Athena, uh, Athena Deimos is in the crowd and led a lot of really beautiful elegies for Altspace VR that just was um, sunsetted this past week, actually, um, just a few days as I was flying out here. It was like the last moment of um, Microsoft pulling the plug. So what's it mean for these communities to exist and then to be um, taken away? How do we honor these experiences, these moments, these communities, these relations, these worlds that now are going to be gone? Or at least they're archived, but it's, it's different. It's like something, there's a death 
And so how do we use these virtual technologies to honor the lives that have come? Virtual violence is also, you know, like a big thing in terms of, you know, these murder simulations. Um, you know, there's been a lot of debate in terms of like 2D, like there's been no evidence that virtual violence in video games has any impact. But what happens when it's fully embodied and you're, you're there and you have a presence and it's like, ethically there feels like there's something different for me when I've had different situations where I've been participating in a simulated like murder or violence. There's a magic circle you enter into, but what's the line between that magic circle that you're entering into and when you're going through the embodied motions, then <clears throat> how much is that sort of impacting us at a deep moral, ethical, psychological way? I did a bunch of interviews. Um, it's called The Gamer's Dilemma. So like what degree are these different dimensions of um, different types of actions in virtual worlds? Are they ethical or not? And uh, uh, in this last series that I have uh, covering XR ethics, I have a couple of people that are talking about that. Andrew um, Kissel, in particular, diving deep into The Gamer's Dilemma. So and going on to uh, philosophy, higher education, law, training is one of the VR's killer apps. So you have Striver that you have um, you know, training of elite quarterbacks. You also have them training Walmart. And there's actually a lot of parallels there because you have to identify the different relational contextual dynamics of the defense of the linebackers. But you also have to identify what's happening in a different you know, dimensions of like Black Friday and be able to make decisions on that. And so on the, in the back room of every Walmart, there is a VR headset that's doing training. And there's also a lot of military training. <clears throat> there's going to be a dimension of like breaking down academic silos within virtual reality in these different contexts. And that's already started to happen. There's an interdisciplinary context for, with virtual reality. Being able to comprehend dimensions of complexity and see the different relational dynamics of things. Uh, Institute for the Future has done a, some interesting work. But as we move on, a lot of these immersive stories are all about trying to connect the dots between what is the hidden aspects of different aspects of reality and how can we use these virtual experiences to tie together the sense of what's happening behind the scenes and what are, what's the full relational dynamics of the nature of reality. Human rights laws and regulations I've mentioned before, but this is going to be a big part of like, what is the metaverse law? Is there going to be like, what's the global jurisdiction? What kind of existing human rights protections are we going to have in these virtual spaces? Um, there's a metaverse initiative in the EU to start to build that to sort of flesh that out. Speculative world building has been a really exciting potential in terms of like Planet City VR was an experience at Tribeca where there was a thought experiment to say what happens if we put all 10 billion people into the state of Texas and let the rest of the Earth go back to seed, and would that be a viable solution for climate change? I don't think that's necessarily feasible, but what that gives you is a design problem for an architect to say, what are the technologies that you would need to do to be able to do that? And could you take those technologies and then put them out and diffuse them out in the world without having to sort of relocate 10 billion people into one place, which I don't think would be a good idea. Um, but there's also like things like indigenous futurism, where um, there's a project called 2167, where you have indigenous creators sort of imagining seven generations in the future. What kind of future do they want to imagine that gets out of the inertia of the moment right now? Um, you know, this is, uh, this is not a ceremony uh, piece that was at Tribeca that's also kind of imagining this more etheric dimension of the relational dynamics of these different mythological creatures and how they in relationship to us. Really amazing piece. The uh, neurospeculative Afrofuturism was a piece that was at uh, Sundance a number of years ago, kind of using virtual reality, kind of imagining these different potential futures of a hair salon that has all these sort of cutting edge neurotech technologies and what would it be like to go into this to get a haircut, but also have the, like different aspects of your brain being read. Um, Future Dreaming was a piece by Sutu that he actually worked with a number of different Aboriginal teens where they imagined their lives five, 10, and 20 years in the future. And it was what was amazing was like you get a sense of like, what is the dream of what you want your life to be in this future? And I was able to go into these different experiences and get a real sense of who these, these teenagers were uh, based upon these different experiences. So being able to imagine our future selves and what we want and what we desire and actually sort of have an embodied experience of that to some degree, is that going to help us create this final causation that allows us to like live into that? Wonder and awe is a big, huge aspect of VR. And Kevin Mack and some of his different experiences have been a great part of kind of expanding my mind about what's possible about the nature of reality. And many different artists, I know Nancy Baker Cahill has been doing lots of amazing work as well in terms of like trying to uh, create these different uh, relational dynamics. So David Chalmers has a whole book called Reality Plus, where he argues that virtual reality is a real reality. There's a bifurcation that we like to say, like, well, this is virtual and this is quote unquote real. What he's arguing is that sort of differentiation is that there are experiences within this virtual context that are just as real and just as meaningful. And even if they're not in a sort of physical reality, that can be just as real. And so he's arguing in this book that VR experiences and these virtual experiences are a genuine reality. Um, and I've been doing a lot of work about process uh, 
philosophy and this paradigm shift as we move away from this idea of saying that the reality is only of this physical material stuff and actually looking at a metaphysical level that all of reality is made up of these processes, processes and potentials that are unfolding and that if you think about the quantum layer, that there are all these relational dynamics of potential that the substance metaphysics doesn't actually really make sense of. The, or if you have like the Everett's many world interpretation that sort of spatializes that out. But the point is, is that those relationships um, are a part of the underlying nature of reality. And so you can say that all of re reality is made out of processes and relationships. And I think that makes a lot of sense for VR. And I've had a number of different uh, interviews with like, Ma Matt Siegel and uh, Grant Maxwell that are kind of elaborating that through this historical philosophical tradition. Um, so the last uh, three here, government institutions, uh, career, spatial design, lots of stuff with spatial architecture um, and other ways of anybody that's doing any type of spatial design. Virtual screens and productivity. If there's nothing else that VR can do other than to kind of replace your monitor, you put on a monitor and you have like 12 screens. You know, if Apple device can do that for like, you know, $3,000 if it's like 4K per eye or whatever and it's high enough, then that may be good enough for people to start to adopt this. That may be like a, a productivity boost that people are like, you know what? I want the maximum number of screens, and that's like the sole use case that they start with. But that's going to be a thing eventually if we have this like replacing of screens. Replace attention monitoring is one of the ethical dilemmas where we have like to what degree are you allowing the companies to track your what's happening in your brain states and your attention, your focus, and kind of like this micromanaging of what, what you're paying attention to. So this is something that Nita Farahani covers a lot within a battle for your brain. Highly recommend her work on that. Got also, governmental mass surveillance, whether it's China or the United States, to what degree is some of this data getting into the hands of oppressive authoritarian regimes and kind of poking people to test their loyalty to the Chinese Communist Party or just, you know, data that's kind of for the part third party doctrine put into the mass surveillance of the United States. To what degree do you have all the spy metric data that's being fed into that? And then the last two here, friends, community, uh, collective culture. There's been lots of communities been uh, cultivated in VR. There will continue to be lots of niche cultures that have been developing, people connecting upon shared identity. This LGBTQ plus uh, meetup in Maltspace had people from around the world. If there's no people geographically located that was it sort of like really puts their lives at stake, um, they're able to connect to a community in these virtual spaces. Um, hanging out with friends, obviously, that's a huge part of just you know, going on these different adventures. Um, algorithm, algorithm bias is a huge aspect in terms of to what degree do we have people that are being tracked um, and um, or have the algorithms that are having bias that are amplifying aspects of uh, discrimination onto at a, at a systemic level. Um, the people that are the most vulnerable having even more injustices that are being done and the uh, work with Algorithmic Justice League and the, the movie Coded Bias is a great reference for that. And then finally, the hidden exiled accessibility. So different ways that VR can start to combat isolation. Um, also accessibility is both an opportunity for making different aspects of experience more accessible, but also a huge challenge in terms of how do we make this technology the most accessible as we can in order to include the most people as we can. So it's still like a big open question as we move forward. So that's sort of like an overview of all the different potentials, <laughs> all the perils. <laughs> And um, I think as I think about this question, at the heart of it is <sighs> allowing, allowing VR to connect to yourself, connect to others, connect to the planet, and connect to all levels of reality. So with that, happy to take some questions. I don't think the Slido was put out. So if you want to line up here and uh, take some questions, or if there are Slido, I'm not sure. Oh yeah, so just go to the go to the microphone. Uh, we got like uh, 11 minutes or so. Happy to answer any questions. And as we have more people, Voices of VR podcast, you can look up and also supported by Patreon. You can support me there. Um, so yeah, thanks. And we've got a question here. Hi, um, I just want to know about eye damage with uh, VR. You know, I've been using it a lot, and I feel like my <coughs> eyes have been affected. So. Part, of, part of the problem is that Meta made this decision to sort of cut back on like what they call the interpupillary distance of like there's usually a distance that people have, but they said, oh, we're going to only make three quantized versions. And so there's a lot of people that are actually using VR with the Quest 2 that are probably using VR with not their correct eye, like IPD, which creates eye strain, which could create other things. I've noticed for myself when I get tired, sometimes I get a little cross-eyed because my eyes are not. so. Um, I don't think there's been any necessarily conclusive studies or anything, but it is an issue. Um, the uh, virgin's accommodation conflict is basically the thing that 
our eyes are used to seeing in depth, but with the fixed plane that sort of like disrupts our normal thing. So they have like a multi-variable focus uh, VR that's potentially going to solve that. Um, so yeah, it's, it's a big open question. And as time goes on, I'll, hopefully there'll be more research on that. Thank you. Hi, my name is Libby. I founded and run a vocational school for software engineers. And our second largest program right now is our extended reality program. We find ourselves, though, in this chicken and an egg situation with the workforce, that we want to be producing the next generation of technologists to be building this. But if there aren't enough companies to hire them, then what service are we doing to those students? That initial graph you had uh, is so compelling. Where do you think we are at on the workforce side of that equation? And what should higher ed institutions be thinking about? Yeah, well, I think that, so my opinion, I feel like there's, there's a part of VR that has a natural organic growth and that it would have been maybe preferable to have things kind of organically grow out of the enterprise space and have like robust ecosystems of development. But the part of the challenge is that you essentially put so much power in the hands of one company, Meta, that can decide whether or not one app exists or not, or whether literally entire industries exist or not um, from a wider perspective. And so their curation strategy has like shaped a lot of this stuff. And so like uh, there is the aspect of the app store. And I feel like part of the, you know, also other enterprise applications like Pico and and maybe Meta will finally get their Meta for Business launched because they've, they were late starting it, they started it, they killed it, it's still not launched even though it's a Quest Pro. So like they basically have dropped the ball on Enterprise because they've prioritized like skipping over to that consumer space. And it's, it's done the overall industry like a disservice because it's not created a robust and, and, and healthy diverse ecosystem of different companies that can sustain themselves in the industry. So given all of that deeper economic context, I think there are opportunities for different industries to start to still find their market, whether it's in the medical field or other enterprise. But like, I feel like it's more of a safer bet to look at what's happening in the B2B space um, rather than just the consumer VR space. Um, so in that sense, I'd recommend looking at different fields like the medical field, different enterprise applications, looking at the research that's been done and start to apply it. Like I know, actually Ryan Schmaltz, you should talk to Ryan because Ryan's actually been doing a lot of that uh, in his previous employment where he was doing a lot of collaboration with like the local hospital to sort of start to use the uh, technologists to develop applications that could be deployed out into different environmental contexts. So uh, that's what I'd say is that you see some folks, the University of Michigan has an innovation center that's also been doing some stuff as well. So cook up with other uh, higher, edu higher ed um, folks and see what they're doing. And um, you know, maybe if we have you know, other conferences of like Oculus uh, Connect or Can Meta Connect, um, you know, if those come back at some point, maybe there'll be more communities to sort of organically meet up with folks. Because it's been, it's been really fragmented since the, the lack of having the folks come together for one location. So that's what I'd suggest. Thank you. Hi, I'm Marianne. I work for the National Film Board of Canada. Um, we do film, but we took a turn to do more VR as well. And this relates to a lot of things we are trying to do at the NFB, especially for the storytelling side. Um, but I was wondering if you see potential in like archiving experiences, things that um, don't really translate with just like a video recap or other format, but really be able to relive the, those experiences. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, this has been an issue in terms of like, again, you get a company like Meta that has been creating this stuff, but then you'll have this whole repository of things like either Oculus Go or other experiences that they'll just like, oh, we're going to take that offline without real insight for how to archive already existing experiences. So you have this kind of like ephemeral nature of like almost like a destruction of cultural heritage that Brewster Kale saw that happening with the internet already. And he created the Internet Archive, which I use literally all the time to like, oh, this website's dead. I need to figure out what this link was from like five years ago because that site's no longer online. Well, with VR, there's a similar sort of ephemerality with it. And I feel like with OpenXR and the Metaverse Standards Forum, we're going to potentially have a method by which that we can have like, hey, let's export this to OpenXR with all these open standards so that it's not like dictated to like this weird subversion of Unity that it only works with this you know, version. And you know, it's like basically a nightmare. So like as we have a way to at least archive these experiences through these open standards that we can start to um, have a way that we can uh, look back on them. Because there is a lot of the cultural heritage of the early days of VR that's been completely annihilated because we haven't been thinking about how to preserve these different experiences. And I think it's a, it's a huge uh, 
thing, and there's not as many people thinking about it. I know John Carmack is concerned about that, but he's kind of moved on to do AGI, and he's not officially affiliated. So, but he did a lot of great work initially, uh, but I hope to see more as we move forward. So, thank you. And we'll go here and then here. Again, um, I'm wondering just about your thoughts of the future of sort of spatial audio in VR and maybe sort of some of the potentials, things that you might find exciting, but also some of the issues that you might think of with kind of the tech or some of the things that aren't really there to fully realize it. Yeah, well, uh, you can think about, I mean, and there's a number of different vectors here. There's like the game engine model where you're already like recreating, like you put a point uh, audio and you're spatializing it, but there's also ambisonic audio, which is like multi-channel recordings where it's like more of recording of a natural sound field so that when you go into that, you can move your head and kind of get to hear that, but I think we'll eventually be moving into like, just like we have a game engine for the physics of the visual aspect, I think we'll move into eventually like an audio engine to sort of recreate the uh, dynamics of the sound. Sound has been like in terms of like the percentage of GPU and everything of like what budget do you get for the sound, it's been like near the bottom because we've been so dominant by the visual field, but I actually feel like there's a lot of room to kind of put more emphasis on that. I know Jessica Brillhart's done a lot of work uh, in the past on spatialized audio, and you know, there's a lot of different you know, creative aspects. So it's like a huge untapped potential. But I think also music production, there's like sort of simple, uh, simple sort of interpretations for how to use the um, spatialized audio. But I actually think like music composition is probably going to be a driving innovator for what's it mean to have like a full spatial architecture to start to like completely reimagine how you can compose a song and maybe have more dynamic interactive elements in there as well. So have more generative or participatory interactive. But you look at like generative AI combined with different aspects of like um, sound engine that goes beyond just the physics engine. I think that's where I see in the future where things might be going. So cool. Thank thanks. You. Yeah, Alex. Hi, Ken. Uh, I was hoping you could share some thoughts on VR being used as a tool for spiritual practice or religious practice or enlightenment. <clears throat> Yeah, well, I think I went, I went to the um, Consciousness Hacking Summit called the Waking Future Summit that was looking at so the psychedelic community matched up with like the spiritual contemplative community matched up with like emerging technologists. And so that intersection of the consciousness hacking community, I think, is really an exciting one because you start to, well, also very scary, but used ethically to kind of like people have control over having that type of biofeedback. And things like TRIP or Helium XR are already like um, different types of applications that are on the forefront of that. Also, I'm Robin Arnott and some of the work that he's done with SoundSelf. Um, so look towards like different ways of um, sort of people using uh, the experience um, for this existing one. But you know, in terms of like um, getting into these altered states of consciousness, uh, you know, talking to the Institute of Neurotic Sciences, they have this idea of like, what if there's latent human potentials that we don't even know that have been unlocked yet? And there's a contextual relational dynamic there that we haven't been in an environmental context for that to fully emerge into like um, some of these different aspects of this latent potentials within us. And so I do think there's actually like not only like existing practices that come from like spiritual practices that you can have like the neuromodulation and feedback to help guide you, but there could be stuff that we don't even imagine yet that's possible that could start to be locked and locked based upon these immersive technologies. So yeah, thanks, good question. Yeah, thanks. Got just a couple minutes. We'll take these last two questions and then we'll wrap up. Okay, rock on. So what you said about the privacy and about the biometrics that are like on a, on a non-invasive biometrics being captured, that was very scary uh, because there's no privacy regulations. Um, it, it, are people working on that? Like I, I just, I was at BCI panels. I spoke with the intelligence community. I spoke with National Homeland Security. Everybody's interested in privacy and transparency. They're like, oh, for BCI, is the FDA is involved in that? They're not, you know, we're, we're protecting people when it comes to invasive and non-invasive -in interfaces. But with non-invasive interfaces, that information is so sensitive and yet there's, there's nothing regulating it. Yeah, so I gave a talk at the uh, Stanford Cyber Policy Center. They had a existing law and extended reality. And my whole talk was like, hey, like basically deep dive, even more detail, a 20 minute, a 19 minute talk elaborating on what needs to happen. So uh, Britton Heller has uh, called for the de definition of something called biometric psychography, which creates a new legal class of data that goes beyond just most biometrics is defined by identity. So identity based uh, biometrics of like, hey, this is Kent versus like, 
can, or this person likes this thing in this context. So our likes, our dislikes in a contextual relational dynamic, this kind of biometric psychographic profiling. And also recommend checking out my latest series where I did um, interviews with folks that are looking at the AI Act in the EU. There's a lot of things of the AI Act that's starting to redefine different aspects of biometrics, but that's in the trilogue process that hasn't finished. And so you have to look and see like what is the final version of that that may have a, a back effect of the GDPR. Um, there's also a Digital Service Act, Digital Market Act that I was talking about. Um, but there's also uh, Nita Farahani, who has the book Battle for Your Brain, uh, which is in the bookstore. I highly recommend you can get an early peek before it releases on Tuesday and have a conversation with her where she's wanting to define a human right of cognitive liberty, which then will say there's a sub-aspect of self-determination, of, of freedom of thought and mental privacy. And there's philosophical things that need to be uh, start to define, but she's an interest, Nita Farahani is an intersection of a neuroscientist, a lawyer, and a legal scholar, like all of the things you want to have this intersection for. And so her book, uh, trying to define this concept of cognitive liberty, I think is like one of the forefront. There's other folks of like uh, Raphael Yusta and the NeuroRights Initiative that is taking more of like the human rights approach of trying to define these other rights of say, mental privacy or I and, uh, identity, the right to identity, right to mental privacy, and the right for um, intentional action or uh, agency. but. They're neuroscientists, they're not lawyers, and they're not sort of like philosophers. And so, you know, there's critiques that Nita has about those approaches that you can look at in her book. Um, and yeah, other than that, um, look to the EU. United States is five to 10 years behind. I don't yeah. have much up there. Yeah, it was the, yeah. It was the US intelligence community I was talking to. Yeah. So yeah. So, <laughs> yeah, we'll take this last question, and then we'll wrap up. Hi. Uh, thanks for the session. Um, my question is, let's say you don't have any limitation with the technology and stuff, where do you see like the most idealistic picture of AR, VR experience in entertainment? Just like how we have YouTube videos and stuff, like is it, it will it be so um, it, like everyday experience where it's every format of video is also in XR and then you just like, um, stream in XR, like how we'll paint a picture where it's yeah. so idealistic. Well, I think the the one way to answer that question is that the answer to that question is going to be different for every single person on the planet. Like their ultimate, most exalted thing that they want to experience. There's going to a whole range, and so the actual real challenge is how do you sort of map that out and match what experiences may already be out there for people to see that and experience, and also to kind of do this fine tuning of experiences with a variety of real time data or other methods to sort of like do a predictive aspect of like what is going to be the best experience for that person that moment. We're entering in a really wild time with generative AI and VR as we move forward, and so there's going to be the lowering of a, a barrier of our imagination and our creativity and our direct experience. And I think as that gap gets closer and closer, like that's going to be the essence of that sort of idealized state, but it's going to be different for each person. So imagine just being able to kind of go into that holodeck type of experience and be able to articulate it um, and be able to come out knowing more about yourself, to be more connected to yourself, to be more connected to other people, connected to the planet, and connected to all dimensions of reality. So, awesome. Well, that's all the time I got. Thank you so much for coming out. Yeah.